Hi everyone, my name is Blair Heckel from the Garobi Marketing Team and welcome to our third day of our Garobi Days digital event. And thank you all for joining us today for this live Ask the Experts session where we will chat with Mike North, Vice President of Broadcast Planning and Scheduling for the NFL. At first glance, the NFL scheduling problem seems simple. Five people have 12 weeks to schedule 256 games over the course of a 17 week season. That might seem like plenty of planning time for seemingly few decisions, but when you actually work it out, the number of possible schedules is well into the quadrillions. Making the problem particularly hard is the necessary inclusion of thousands of constraints addressing stadium availability, travel considerations, competitive equity, and television viewership. In 2013, the NFL began using Garobi's Mathematical Optimization Solver to tackle this incredibly complex scheduling problem. With mathematical optimization, NFL planners can generate and analyze more than 50,000 feasible schedules despite adding more constraints to the process every year. Now, instead of spending months manually creating a single feasible schedule, the NFL planners can focus on evaluating and comparing completed schedules to determine which should be selected as the final schedule. In this fireside chat with Mike North and Groby's Vice President of Engineering, Greg Glockner, we will discuss the process of creating the 2019 NFL schedule and some issues and constraints with the 2020 schedule. I will now introduce you to your speakers for today. Michael North is in his 25th season with the NFL and his 22nd in the broadcasting department, where he is part of the team that creates the playing schedule each season. Mike works closely with the 32 clubs, network television partners, stadium operators, and the NFL's international team while managing the relationships with software and hardware vendors, as well as mixed integer programming, combinatorial optimization, and predictive analytics experts in an effort to help search through the millions of permutations in pursuit of the one magical, mythical, perfect NFL schedule each season that satisfies all of the teams and television networks. A 1992 graduate from Washington University in St. Louis with a degree in computer science, Mike lives with his artist wife, his three teenage sons, two dogs, and a turtle in Westchester County, New York tantalizingly close to the Hudson National Golf Club. And we also have Greg Glockner, Vice President of Garobi Optimization. Greg has a BS magna cum laude from Yale University in Applied Mathematics and Music, and a Master's of Science and PhD in Operations Research from the Georgia Tech Institute of Technology. His doctoral dissertation was awarded the 1997 Transportation Science Dissertation Prize from Informs. Greg has trained users of optimization software in Brazil, Hong Kong, Japan, Singapore, South Korea, and all throughout the US and Canada. He is an expert in, optimize, in optimization modeling and software development. His professional experience in software development includes all major platforms and the nine of the top 10 programming languages in the TIOBE Programming Community Index. Prior to joining Garobi Optimization in 2009, Greg was partner and chief operating officer for Dwaffler, a provider of decision analysis tools. From 1998 to 2007, he worked at iLog in two different positions as a senior technical account manager and a product manager. As an iLog senior technical account manager, he introduced advanced optimization and rule software to customers across North America. He introduced, he was responsible for product management of CPLEX, ODM, OPL, and Solver. From 1997 to 1998, he worked at Pacific Gas and Electric, where he developed stochastic programming software for hydroelectric power scheduling, and he built statistical tools for energy trading in the deregulated energy market. He also worked as an operations research analyst for the Federal Aviation Administration and for Northwest Airlines. So I will now turn the presentation over to get started. Thank you and welcome Mike and Greg. Thanks so much, Blair. All right, Mike. So. I've got a bunch of questions for you to get started. And uh, for those of you in the audience, if you, as you've got questions, please be sure to post them uh, in the Whova and Zoom platforms. And I will then take those and ask those to Mike uh, throughout our, our, our chance to chat here. Um, so to get started, 
Um, I think one of the great parts about what you do, Mike, at the NFL is how relatable your work is. Everybody can identify with the schedule of their home team, you know, where the home games are, the away games, the key matchups. You know, you tune into sports radio and they spend hours just talking about how terrible our schedule is and how better it is for the rivals, you know, how much easier they've got it. So I'm curious to know when you chat with people about your work, you know, what do you say when you meet somebody in a social situation at a bar or at a party and they learn? And the first thing they do is complain about, you know, why do you make my favorite team play in Florida in September or in Green Bay in December? How do you talk with them about what you do? If the person doing the complaining truly wants to have a conversation, I'm happy to do it. I really am. I used to earlier in my career tell people I worked for a bank or I you know, worked in a library, but um, there are so many people who are such passionate football fans, not only NFL fans, but football and, and all sports, that when you find somebody who really is curious and really wants to understand and really wants to know, hey, how does something like that happen? I'm happy to do it. If the person simply wants to yell and scream and uh, complain, I'll go back to telling them I work at a bank. But the truth is most people, once you get to talk to them and, and um, explain, you know, there's no conspiracy theory. Nobody is trying to stick it to their team. Uh, it's just a, a little bit of randomness, a little bit of human iteration, a lot of software, a lot of search, a lot of optimization. Generally, they understand. And if you explain it to them, in the sense that, hey, if you're really disappointed about something in this year's schedule, you're probably not going to see it in next year's schedule. And you probably didn't see it in last year's schedule. So hopefully as the pain and the bad luck just kind of moves around, it, it spreads itself around thinly uh, and, and hopefully evenly so that, you know, that which you were really mad at me for last year won't be something uh, that you're mad at me for next year. There'll be something else, I'm sure. Well, but within the business of the sport, you can't, you can't uh, uh, give them the excuse that you work for a bank. So when you're talking to, you know, uh, owners, uh, uh, coaches, players, or other executives within the NFL and the league level, how do you explain, you know, what you do in the side of optimization besides just saying, oh, why don't you just plug it into a spreadsheet? Well, the first thing I try to do when I talk to somebody like that, who I work with, who, who knows what I do, um, is really try to find out why they're disappointed. Is it something that is truly unfair? Or is it something that, hey, you know, would have been better if, or this was a little extra drama or a challenge for, you know, my equipment staff or my quarterback or my defensive line, you know, if it's something that was just, hey, bad break, just wanted you to know, those happen all the time. I mean, no team loves their schedule, certainly not in April or May when it comes out. Everybody's got a bone to pick and something that they wish was a little different. Uh, but if somebody's got something that is truly unfair and we go back and we do the research and we look and it turns out that, you know, eight of the last 10 times a team has had to play a road game, cross country, three time zones, coming off a Monday night against a team that made the playoffs the previous year coming off their bye week, um, then maybe that's something we ought to pay a little bit more attention to moving forward. So th the good news is, um, people are getting a lot smarter. People are understanding the concept, really, of optimization a lot more and understanding I, I can't have everything I want, but if I prioritize it for you, maybe you can better understand what really is and isn't unfair in my eyes, and, and the scheduling team can make more informed decisions when we have a better understanding of everybody's priorities. So those situations then, have you, has it helped you to identify, say, new objectives and new constraints to add into the model when you've had those conversations with the, the television executives or the, or the uh, um, owners, players, uh, or other executives within the NFL? Yeah, very, very much so. The, the schedules that we created, you know, even five years ago, but going back 10 or 15 years and we were still doing it by hand, one game at a time, one tag at a time, looking back on those schedules now, makes us all wince. I mean, there were things that we did in those schedules, you know, both in terms of competitive fairness for our clubs and also for, you know, revenue and viewership opportunities for our television partners. They all go in the same bucket. And that's the beauty of optimization. We can throw all these things into the stew and, and just keep stirring and give it a little taste and nope, a little bit more Jaguars, a little less Texans, keep spinning it, give it another taste. 
no, we need more ESPN. We need a little less Thursday night football. And just keep stirring and just keep tasting. The more we can iterate like that, the closer we feel like we can get to optimal. Do we ever get there? Probably not. But I'd like to think we're getting closer. And the fact that we're getting more feedback from our constituents, both in terms of our television partners and, you know, their projections for viewership and fan interest, and also from our clubs in terms of this is fair, this is not fair. We had to do this last year. Sure, hope we don't have to do it again for three or four more years. And, oh, by the way, our stadium's not available this weekend. And technically it's available that weekend, although it'll be a real challenge to get it ready. So just keep that in mind. But don't ruin my schedule otherwise. So, like you said, everybody wants the same thing. Home away, home away, home away. Open at home, close at home, mid-season buy. Nobody wants to go to Florida as the road team in September. Nobody wants to go to Cleveland or Pittsburgh or Lambeau in December when it's snowing. You know, somebody's going to have to do it. Hopefully the bad luck and the pain moves around. And if it fell on you last year, it won't fall on you next year. So I love that idea where you're sort of taking the – both the science and the art, you know, the, the sort of craft of building optimization. So that's a good lead way into the next question. So, you know, you study computer science, how, but where did you get your intro to and, and getting started with the, the field of optimization? Uh, you know, the first time I really thought that there was a path, uh, a career path for me, at least in sports, um, was my junior year of college and I was taking a symbolic logic class, uh, CS 507T at the engineering school at Wash U. Um, and, and I remember thinking to myself, you know, you can solve all the way for this extreme and make 100% of the people on this side of the box happy, but now you're going to have 0% of the people on this side happy. Or you can do it the other way. You could solve it for 100% these guys make them happy. You know, all these guys are going to be mad. And what I kind of realized and what I kind of, you know, explain it to myself and explain it to people when I meet them, like you say, in a restaurant or in a bar is everybody is going to be disappointed. You know, this schedule, the NFL sports really are, are a zero sum game. If it's good for the Texans, it's bad for the Jaguars and for our television partners. You know, if it's good for CBS, it's bad for Fox. So we're never going to make everybody happy. Hopefully we can make them all equally disappointed. And that's sort of how I started thinking about it back in my junior year in college and sort of dovetailed into some of the coursework I was doing my senior year and really beginning to get an understanding for if you turn this dial all the way up, then you're going to pay for it somewhere else. And if you want all the columns even across the top, you know that you're never going to maximize all those columns. So I always kind of look at it as disappointing everybody evenly, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to come to some of the audience questions. There's going to be a mix of things that came in from um, your scheduling talk, as well as things that are coming in live right now. So one of the questions is, um, what defines the, the variables and inputs? For example, television assignment, uh, you know, you talked in your um, previous uh, recording uh, presentation about uh, the stadium side and the matchups, but you know, what role does, you know, does the television side or the, um, and you've talked a lot about the evenness and fairness, how do you define the different, the different variables and criteria that goes in? Yeah, it's a couple of different ways we do it. Um, first and foremost, um, we meet with our television partners. You know, they do pay the league uh, billions of dollars in rights fees. And we have tried to, um, like we said, really understand their business better. You know, it's easy for any of us to look at the list of 256 games for any season and pick out the great ones. You know, Packers, Cowboys, you know, Chiefs, Niners, uh, you know, the games that sound like football games. You know, those are easy. You can take the ones at the top end and you can dole them out fairly across your partners. And certainly there's some ones at the bottom end where teams are still developing or rebuilding and maybe don't have a, a run of success recently. It's all those games in the middle that we've got to try to figure out how to dole out fairly. And so by talking to the network partners, you get a better understanding from them of, you know, what they constitute success. Obviously, it's television viewership, it's revenue, it's advertising sales, 
but they've got a whole business ecosystem there that they're feeding, whether it's their local affiliates, some of which are owned and operated by the network, others that are uh, buying the time from uh, the owner of the television station. And so the dollars are one thing, but really the metrics that we use for success don't just include the dollars. So we meet with our television partners, we go through our list, you know, again, they're all telling us a lot of stuff that we know already. If the Packers and the Cowboys are playing each other in any given season, every television partner would love that game. Fox would love it for a Sunday afternoon at 425 Eastern. NBC would love it. Monday Night Football would love it. NFL Network would love it. CBS would take it if we could cross flex it. So that's one of those linchpin decisions that we have to make somewhere early in the process. Who gets Cowboys Packers? And once you made that decision, now you know somebody's pretty happy. And they're probably going to have to be a little disappointed in our next decision. But the the guy that didn't get Packers Cowboys, what are we going to do to make them feel like we heard them? So if you don't get Packers Cowboys, maybe you get Seahawks Cowboys or Packers Bears. And there's two Packers Bears. So how do you dole them out? Play one early, play one late, play one in prime, play one in Sunday afternoon. So the truth is we meet with the television partners. They've got their list. They've got their requests. There's a lot of really smart people looking back through years and years of history. This performed well. This didn't. Here's what we'd love to see again. Here's what we'd rather avoid if we could. And then we're trying to really take advantage. Like you said, there's art and science. The art is meeting with the humans and, oh, I think this team's going to be good or I think that game's going to rate well. Now there's some science to it. That Packers-Cowboys game, we know if we put it on Sunday Night Football, it's heading for a 16 rating and 25 million people. Is that maximizing viewership for the National Football League? It might be maximizing viewership for Cowboys-Packers in one given week. But how do we maximize viewership across all of our weeks and all of our television partners and maybe deploying Cowboys Packers on a Sunday afternoon isn't the best use of all of our inventory. Maybe we can plug the holes in the Fox schedule created by not having Packers Cowboys with two or three or six or eight other games, whereas Packers Cowboys on a Sunday night or a Monday night becomes a tent pole for that schedule. And if you give them Cowboys Packers, then you don't have to give them Cowboys Seahawks or something like that. So the optimization is really kind of trying to tilt us a little bit more toward the science than the art, which is how we were doing it, you know, all day, every day back when we were building it by hand. So you talk about the value and a couple of people have been asking in the, in the chat, um, have you been, have you and the rest of the league uh, been able to measure the value uh, that the optimization is bringing back to you? Like, you know, is it, it you know, it's either increasing the, the value of the te television contracts, the value of, of uh, the revenues for the individual teams. How, what have you been able to do to measure the impact of this optimization projects that you've been working on all these years? Yeah, the, the challenge for us when, you know, we talk about being judged or, or graded on our output is that the schedule came out, you know, month and a half ago. It looked great <laughs> on May 9th. Uh, who knows what happens by the time September rolls around and these games start getting played and, you know, November and December rolls around and there's always teams that you didn't see coming that are now in playoff chases and there's teams that you were counting on and, you know, one bad injury or, or one bad break and all of a sudden, you know, the, the skids get greased and they're heading for six and 10. So, um, it, it's hard really to, you know, give ourselves a grade each year, but, but you made a reference to, you know, the value of our partnerships, to the value of our deals, whether they are the network television deals, our radio deals, our digital product, our sponsorship deals, stadium naming rights, PSLs, um, you know, by, by just about any metric, uh, it, it's hard to argue that, you know, the NFL hasn't been, you know, continually you know, up and to the right, like we say. Um, that, that, that's the way we want to trend. That's the way we want to go. We want to see that line keep moving up and to the right. And there's no question, uh, the optimization piece allows us to take so many more factors into account now. Is it the perfect schedule? No such thing. Um, you know, were we a hundred percent right on which teams were going to make the playoffs and, and get the highest ratings? If we knew that we probably wouldn't be building these schedules. We'd probably be living in Vegas and, and making a living, uh, you know, betting on these games. But, um, you know, we talk to our clubs, we talk to our network partners, uh, we try to disappoint everybody evenly, and, and then we've got six months to wait for the schedule to actually, you know, manifest itself and see if we guessed right or guessed wrong. And to the great credit of our partners, uh, both at the teams and, and at the 
television networks, you know, if we guess wrong, we've got some trap doors, we've got some bells and whistles, we've got some levers, we've got some things we could pull where, you know, let's move this game out of what we thought was going to be a great opportunity in a national window. And maybe it goes back to a Sunday afternoon window where it goes to 20, 25%. But instead, we can grab this game that maybe was only headed for 15 or 18% of the country because we didn't know that the, you know, Chargers against the Titans game was, was going to be for two playoff spots. So we've got an opportunity to, you know, with proper notice and, and with enough advanced planning, move some of the key games around, get them into bigger windows and, and let more fans see them. If it turns out that, you know, we didn't foresee that game being as important back in May. That's a really good lead into a couple of follow on questions. So when you do those types of uh, changes to the schedule, you know, to what extent is that um, an analytical or even an optimization process, or it's more like, yeah, we've kind of looked at the, um, at the results of how the teams are unfolding. And now we've, you know, we've decided that, yeah, this matchup, this one matchup that we said wasn't as high of a priority now looks like a really great priority because these teams have outperformed what people were expecting. At the same time, these other teams get, you know, some injuries and they're not looking on, on, on to be so, so, uh, you know, they're not as competitive this season as, as everybody predicted. So what, yeah. what, when that, when those changes are going to come into the schedule, how are you, um, how are you approaching them now? it's both. It's a lot of gut and feel and instinct. And it's also a lot of data and analytics. You know, like we said, any fan can look at a game in any window and say, that's one I want to watch. By the same token, any fan could look at a game in a window in November and say, what were those morons thinking back in May, putting this game in prime time? I don't want to watch that. Um, We know we're fans too. So if we can look at the games, we can see where there's an opportunity to make an improvement. uh, We certainly will. Um, where the analytics can come in and help us is things that, you know, weren't even options not that long ago. Things like social media sentiment. You know, if we're trying to guesstimate, uh, you know, who's interested in watching this game, uh, one great way to tell is is by, you know, following social media. If there's a lot of Twitter buzz, if there's a lot of Facebook posts, if there's a lot of interaction with, you know, our digital products, and it sure seems like the Cleveland Browns are hot and fans are interested, uh, you know, that's telling us something. And if they're interested in these other platforms, they're probably going to interested, be interested when we put that game on television in a national window. So part of it is, is gut and feel and instinct. And this game sounds better than that game. And I think this team's going to play that team close. And oh, by the way, this team is heading for the playoffs. It would be good to get them some exposure to our fan base here in December so that, you know, divisional weekend isn't the first time people are meeting them. You know, you think about a team like the Tennessee Titans last year. You know, they did not have a lot of national television in the regular season, but when it got to November and December, it became pretty apparent they were going to be in this thing right to the end. So having an opportunity to expand the footprint for some of those games, part of it came from gut and feel and and, a little aim high steering, but also some of it came from our social media sentiment. Some of it came from, you know, fans just plain old emailing us, you know, going on to NFL.com, clicking on the contact us link and saying, where are the Titans games? So, you know, to the extent that you can measure that, uh, you know, we're trying to be responsive, we're trying to be respectful. Um, And then, of course, you've got to reach out to the Titans and their opponents and figure out, hey, if we move this game in a couple of weeks, you know, to this window or moved you into a primetime slot, how does that change your planning? How does that change affect your ticket holders? So there's a lot of moving pieces. There's there's never a right answer. There's never an easy answer. But uh, hopefully we're getting closer. So the other side of that is um, a big area in in the field of optimization for the last 20 or so years has been optimization with uncertainty. So you've really talked in the last few minutes about the uncertainty that, you know, you're releasing the schedule in the spring, not knowing exactly uh, how strong the teams are from competitiveness and how strong they're going to be from, from uh, the fan base. So where are, where are you either currently or looking to bring in some of that uncertainty, bring it back into the planning phase that you're doing uh, over the winter and early spring? Yeah, we think about it really as uh, risk mitigation. You know, if, if you're going to put the Dallas Cowboys on national television, you're probably going to do okay. Uh, They have a very long history of delivering very high ratings to our network partners. There's a reason why when we meet with all of our network partners every year, you know, they're asking for those Cowboys games. They're asking for the Packers games, the Steelers games, the brands, you know, that we all know and grown up with and and have had 
you know, some success over the last decade or two. You know, for the brands that are still building their identity, you know, the league has to think about all 32 equally, certainly, but also, you know, which has a bigger risk. You know, we talk about the Cleveland Browns, you know, last season, they seemed like the team that had won the off season, if you will. You know, their quarterback looked like he could play a little bit. They signed Odell. They were a team that was, you know, on everybody's tip of everybody's tongue. They were a trendy pick for a playoff spot. So there was a lot of discussion about, okay, how best to maximize these Cleveland Browns games. And one school of thought was get them all in early while they're still hot and everybody's still interested. One school of thought was save them until later. And if they are in a playoff chase, you know, a division game between AFC North rivals, Pittsburgh, Baltimore, things like that. Those sound like football games. Those sound like opportunities to deliver for our fans. So it becomes a bit of a dance. And, you know, if you know there's a high end, you also have to be comfortable with the low end as well. And as we mentioned, if, if the low end happens to fall on a Sunday afternoon, whether it's flexible scheduling for Sunday night or for the TBD pools for our Saturday and Sunday games late in the season, you know, you've got an opportunity to adjust later than instead of having to stake your claim in May and saying, this is the game we're counting on and this is the game we believe is going to matter. And then, frankly, we spend six months crossing our fingers and, and hoping that's true. Absolutely. Um, so, um Coming back to the presentation you gave earlier, um, you talked in there about seed schedules and you had a couple of slides where you showed a, a couple of sample seed schedules. And then of course, the, the second half is completing that out into a full schedule. So one question that came out during that presentation was, you know, what goes into the construction of those seed schedules? Is that a more manual process or is that also an optimization-based process? Again, a little bit of both, a little bit of art, a little bit of science. The, the, the challenge for the scheduling team is that, you know, if we do it manually, we could build a perfect seed schedule. This is a great Sunday night schedule, a great Monday night schedule. Love the way the double headers line up here for CBS and Fox. And this has got a real nice flow to the Thursday night schedule with big brands here and, and maybe, you know, riskier brands here, but then come back with a game that sure as heck is going to matter by the time we get to it. And, and then these two teams playing each other in December. You know, you could build that by hand and it looks great and it feels great. And then you hit that solve button and it says, nope, sorry. Well, what's the point of that? You know, there's no value to building a 40 or 50 game seed if that seed doesn't finish. So as you know, we've had this conversation for a decade now, back to your days, you know, in your old job, you know, building the seed schedule that isn't instantly infeasible is challenge enough to then also build the seed schedule that has just the right feel for Sunday nights and Monday nights and Thursday nights is probably something that the humans can't do. So that's where, you know, the optimization piece comes in. If we give the guidelines, if we give the guardrails, here's a pool of games we're willing to see on Sunday night. Here's a pool of games we're willing to see on Monday night. Make sure you get two of those guys and three of those guys. And you can do one of those guys, but no more than one. And unfortunately this season, none of those guys, you know, go. And then if the science can take over at that point, then we can react to the output with actual feasible finished schedules and say, all right, good to know that finished, but if we could change one thing, it would be maybe moving this game three weeks earlier, or maybe moving this game off of Sunday night and putting it back on Sunday afternoon, run it again. Okay, now that I see what the impact of that decision was, change our mind, let's go back, put that game back on Sunday night. It was fine right where it was, but this time let's move this game for Fox out of week three and into week nine. Do it again, do it again, do it again. The more we can iterate, the more we can interact, the better off we're going to be at the end because as good as a computer is, it still just does what it's told, right? So it's still going to come down to a human. And, and, and for now, that's, you know, Howard Katz, my boss, and, and obviously Roger Goodell, the commissioner. They're the ones who are going to have to look at the end product and say, yeah, that feels right. You know, all the optimization, all the AI, all the machine learning in the world still can't replace the human saying that feels right to me. So the more we look at, the more we see, the more options we have, the better we can feel about, hey, this is the one that feels the best. 
Uh, in, in that interim review, is that your, just your team or do you bring in some outside people to, you know, from the television side, from the, from the teams themselves to sort of, uh, sort of give you a, a, a feel of that? Or have you developed so much understanding of that that you've, you've now kind of assimilate that onto your own team? Yeah, we've built a, a team of, uh, you know, not rivals necessarily, but hopefully people that bring different skill sets to the problem. Um, you know, like I said, Howard Katz runs the scheduling process. He was uh, a network president, ran NBC, uh, excuse me, ABC and ESPN for a while. He certainly has the network television partner side of the equation down. Um, you know, we've added people like Ani Bose, who we brought out of the events group, brought back to broadcasting. He did about 10 years with us, went up to the events group and came back. Sort of has a feel now for, you know, those big events and, and what makes this Sunday night game bigger than that Sunday night game or this Monday night game bigger than that Monday night game. Uh, Blake Jones is part of the team. He grew up in the game. His dad ran the Jaguars and the Packers for a while. So, you know, he grew up in locker rooms and on sidelines. He understands what it means for the equipment manager to have to pack up the, uh, you know, 18 wheeler after the game and get on an airplane and, and, and turn around and be ready to play again in three days. If you're going to play a short week Thursday, um, Charlotte Carey joined our team. She's got an analytical background with a lot of the math, a lot of the science. You know, we're really lucky to have a diverse group. Do we have it completely licked? No, we certainly don't. So that's why, you know, we've spoken, um, you know, with the guys at Garobi uh, throughout the process. Uh, our friends out at Optimal Planning Solutions in Western Canada, who you know, um, you know, they build our schedule, but they also build a dozen, a dozen other sports leagues around the world. And so hopefully every time they build, you know, the Scottish Premier League soccer or the Amsterdam team handball or the Major League Baseball schedule, they learn a little something more and they can bring that back to us and firmly believe a rising tide lifts all boats. So if baseball or basketball or the Bundesliga can do it better and we can all learn from it, um, we're happy to. But as you mentioned earlier, you know, there is certainly a lot more room in the process now for uh, analytics and, and we've got some outside partners, a company out of Boston called Recentive Analytics, a company out of Northern Virginia called XIJ that we work with. And they're trying to help us really understand, like we said, some of the risk mitigation. You want to roll the dice on a game like this? Okay, here's your upside, particularly if it's in October, but here's your downside if you put that game in December and the quarterback gets hurt. So really trying to understand the impact of some of our decisions hopefully has made us smarter. Uh, again, we'll, we'll see in six months. Well, it sounds like a pretty, a couple of people have asked this question, so I'm going to kind of consolidate this question. It sounds like it's a, it's a pretty big team and a, and, a, and a pretty major level of effort. So talk, talk us through what's the, the, how many people have to touch the, touch the schedule? When, so when do things start? You know, you and I have talked about that, but for our audience here, when do you, when do you start that, uh, that planning session? How many people both, you know, within the NFL, outside uh, uh, people, both Optimal Planning, Garobi, other folks, some of these other uh, uh, analytics uh, firms that you've been talking about. How many people does it take to build out? How many man months does it take to bring this from, from you know, studying last year's schedule to it's, it's spring and now I've published the, the next year's schedule? Yeah, it, it takes a village. Um, truth is, uh, we're using the time now, uh, you know, May through December, is a lot of rehashing and um, summit meetings and what worked, what didn't, what should we try differently next time? Um, you know, you mentioned all our stakeholders. There's a lot of people, everybody's an expert, nobody knows anything, but uh, you know, we'll talk to everybody that we think can help us. Once the process starts though, once uh, the season ends and we've got our 256 matchups, get through the playoffs, get through the Super Bowl from you know, mid-February to mid-May now, um, there's, there's very few people that touch this. It's, it's the five of us locked in a room, um, you know, the four of us with Howard. And the only person outside of that room that sees our work is the commissioner. Um, you, you can't share a beta version of the schedule with anybody because, like we said, nobody's going to be happy with it. And the way the puzzle comes together, it is so interconnected. You know, it's a jigsaw puzzle, right? If you take one piece out of a jigsaw puzzle, it doesn't have another home. You can't put it someplace else and just put the jigsaw puzzle back together. You can, but it's going to look a lot different. And if we like the way the jigsaw puzzle looks, you can't take something out of one spot and put it in a completely different spot. You have to kind of massage where that piece fits and, and maybe massage the pieces around it. So, 
you know, once the process starts, the team gets real small, real quick. Um, and yeah, it's a lot of pressure. It's, uh, an impossible mathematical exercise. I hope we're getting closer to it. I feel like the team has really developed, um, just in terms of our communication and our role. And, and it was tested really this year, if you think about it, you know, with COVID and the work from home, you know, it was March 13th or so. I think it was Friday, March 13th was the last time we all saw each other face to face, locked in our little windowless airless room. Uh, everything else had to migrate to to virtual at that point. The fact that we were still able to get one done and we were still able to, um, you know, put something out in May that, that we were proud of, I think is a testament to the team and, and certainly to the technology, you know, not just, you know, Zoom meetings and things like that, but also, as you mentioned, you know, the guys at Garobi, the folks at AWS, our friends out at Optimal Planning, everybody really had to, uh, you know, pull their socks up and, and dig in a little harder. And, and we were really fortunate to have a lot of really good partners helping us and, you know, hope we landed in a good spot. Uh, I see one of the questions here asking about 2020 versus 2019 because of COVID. It was obviously different, you know, not just for the team, um, but also for the technology. Uh, you know, we certainly weren't the only ones on Zoom. There were a lot of Zoom meetings going on and we certainly weren't the only ones hitting AWS's spot market. You know, there were definitely nights where, you know, I was trying to spin up instances and I was finding fewer of them available and you got to figure people were using them to build infrastructure for, you know, work from home for their companies or heck even using them to try to search for a vaccine. And, you know, I, I kind of wondered if I was, you know, being inappropriate by trying to spin up another couple hundred servers to figure out if there was a better home for Packers Cowboys while people were trying to, you know, use the technology for something presumably a little bit more important, but 2020 was an interesting challenge, still is. Um, you know, we've got to get these teams back into their facilities and figure out training camps and preseason and fans in the buildings. And uh, there's a lot of work still to do. I, I hope our 2020 schedule that we put out in May is, is the one we get to play exactly the way we drew it up. Uh, if not, I'm, I'm confident we can, you know, uh, do what we need to do to adjust, uh, as always, like we did for the draft. You know, the NFL's had a very interesting offseason with free agency, with the draft. Um, even with schedule release, you know, schedule came out May 7th, I think it was this year. That's a couple of weeks after the draft. Presumably that becomes our new pattern moving forward. I think that's the new normal. And that gives the scheduling team a little time, not a lot, but a little to react to the draft. You know, I think we all kind of knew Joe Burrow was going to Cincinnati, but you know, what if something major had happened? What if, you know, uh, they traded, uh, you know, Eli Manning and Eli Manning went to the Bengals. All of a sudden that Bengals Giants game means a lot more. You know, the value of that asset has shifted from what we thought it was in January to what it is now that Eli Manning is going to be quarterbacking the Bengals. So, you know, waiting to put the schedule out a little later obviously helps us react to things like the draft and also gives us just a little bit more time to search through this infinite space, you know, looking for the magical, mythical, perfect schedule. So you, you've you touched on a lot of great stuff there. And one of the questions that I, I had coming in, and it even also came, you touched on it and one of the audience members came in, what other impacts are the, um, the COVID-19 having on, on the schedule? I know there's, you know there's lots to be said. I'm not you know, necessarily looking for you for everything related to the NFL, but you've got a little bit of time right now because you know basketball, golf, even NASCAR, some of these sports have already had to put their schedules on hold, baseball as well. And you're, you're, this hit, hits the NFL in the off season. So you've got a little bit more time to react. Some sports have said, okay, we're going to, you know, we're going to change things by having all these games, at these locations, you know, in fewer locations or, you know, in, in compressed time frames. Are you looking at any sort of re having to reschedule in, in response to that? Or are you still in kind of a wait and see uh, uh, situation? Are, are, you know, what, where, where are you in sort of having to replan this in a, in a world that, uh, None of us were expecting a year ago. We're all in a wait and see scenario. There's no question about that. Uh, you know, as far as the NFL is concerned, there's obviously never a good time for a global pandemic. But March through August, yeah, that might be about the best we could have hoped for. So, um, you know, it's obviously uh, impacted our off season. But again, incredible credit to you know our players, our coaches, our staff, uh, our team personnel. You know, we're we're, we're getting by and we're planning and hoping and expecting to start the season on September 10th in Kansas city with the Super Bowl champions and, and go from there. But, you know, if we can't 
we'll adjust. Are we looking at every possible outcome? No, there's hundreds, thousands, millions of them at this point. But, you know, if we weren't able to play on September 10th, what would we do instead? If we can't play in a certain building, but we can play in others, what would we do instead? If we get started and the season starts fine, and then like you're starting to see with some of these other sports, you know, a disruption might hit in the middle. What then? Um, we're looking at all the possibilities, not making any decisions yet, because again, I, I think the virus is going to make some of these decisions for us. And um, it is truly changing, not even by the day, but almost by the hour. You know, two weeks ago, if we'd have had this conversation, you know, I think everybody would have been supremely confident that everything was quote unquote returning to normal and opening back up again. Um, you know, the colleges were starting to get the kids back on campus, back in the weight room. Now, here we are two weeks later, and, you know, as expected, you know, some of the spread of the disease and the infections has, has gone up enough to make everybody go back in their homes for another three months? Probably not. But that's not a decision, honestly, that the schedule makers of the NFL are going to make. That's a decision that, you know, the health experts are going to make. And every conversation that we've had with the NFL, every Zoom conversation, every owner meeting, every conversation has been led with we're going to follow the science. We're going to go with what the medical experts tell us is and is not feasible. And that may manifest itself in things in our schedule that, you know, maybe we hadn't planned for. You know, one of the things I think I talked about in, in the uh, presentation before was, you know, as our constituents get smarter, they ask for more things. And one of the things that we got, you know, more than ever this year was clubs asking about pairing up cross-country travel this year. I know I have to travel three time zones, three or four times this year, instead of doing them one a month and having to make eight trips across the country, could we pair up a couple of our cross country trips? Could you, the schedule makers, find it in your hearts to schedule us in back to back weeks cross country and we will go and we'll stay and we'll find a place to practice and we'll find a place to have our meetings and we'll find a place to stay and eat and then we'll play the other game while we're there and then we'll come home. Now I'm not sure how feasible that's going to be. We'll see what happens when we get to October and November. But, you know, as always, some of our best laid plans uh, may have to be adjusted. So a number of questions have been coming by. Thanks, Mike. A number of questions have been coming by that are fairly technical. I want to get into at least, you know, time permitting some of the, some of the, the technical details. A couple of people have asked, um, you know, a little bit more about the timing. So when you're, when the, I know you start the scheduling, you know, Monday, well, you, you started in, in earnest Monday morning after Super Bowl. When you start to put together, you've got the seed schedules, you've got the, the, the different constraints. At, how long does it take you from that start point to when, you're, when, they, when you and your team and, and, and the others that you work with start to look at the first feasible schedules? How much how much time does that take to, to you know, basically when you put those inputs in, you run them through Garobi and the software that, that's been developed for NFL and starting to look at that. What does that look like? And then, of course, how much refinement goes in after that? Yeah, that, that's the real challenge. You know, and I think you and I had this conversation 10 years ago. The more rules we put in, the better the product at the end, but the longer it's going to take us to get there. So earlier in the process, when we've got our 256 matchups, a handful of television considerations, a few stadium blocks, you hit the button, you know, you can get a feasible schedule back in hours, minutes even, sometimes. Um, but, you know, that's not our best schedule. There's no two ways around it. So what are we going to adjust off of this schedule to get better? And sometimes you know, you don't know it until you see it. And like we said, a lot of this is feels like a football game, sounds like a football game. Oh, I think they're going to be happy with that result. You know, sometimes you don't know it until you see it. So you have to iterate over and over and over again. Early in the process, you know, early February, when we haven't written all of our rules yet, you know, we're turning feasible schedules out in a matter of hours. You could have nice low scores. We're still using that same negative base scoring system we developed you know, 15 years ago, every time something goes wrong, every time there's a team or a network complaint, it brings a penalty value with it. If it's a small problem, maybe it's a 20 point penalty. And if it's a big problem, it's maybe a 200 point penalty. Um, so we're constantly dialing in those penalty values and trying to figure out, you know, this relative to that, is it 2x? Is it 3x? Is it 1.5x? If we want the computer to come up with the right result, we've got to guide it in the right direction to make sure it understands what our priorities are. So Early in the process, schedules in minutes, hours, as we start adding more and more rules and the solution space gets tighter, 
and you know branches of the, of the search tree start getting lopped off, it becomes harder and harder to find those feasible schedules. You know, the way we work is still on a, call it a 24 hour cycle. Um, we come in in the morning or get on Zoom in the morning, um, go through the six or eight or 10 finished schedules that we have from the overnight runs. And there's always something wrong with them. Uh, always something could be better, always something that isn't properly being captured. So um, let's analyze, let's go through every single schedule, top to bottom, right to left, as though we're the general manager or head coach of each of the 32 teams as though we're the network president of each of the six network partners, find all the things that are wrong with them and decide how do we want to address these. You might just have to wince and deal with it, or you might have to write a rule that says, I never want to see that again. So you write 8, 10, 20 new rules based off of the analysis you did from last night's schedules. That takes a few hours. And then you run the computers again, and they run all night, 12 to 18 hours, depending on how many AWS instances we spin up. You come in in the morning, you've got 8 or 10 new schedules. Presumably, your scores have gone up, because you further constrained the problem, but those schedules should be better. That which we hated yesterday should not be there now. What do we hate today? Well, let's write a rule to fix that. And so it's all day, every day, constant iteration. And at some point, as in any optimization problem, you hit a wall. We just cannot do everything we were hoping to do. We thought there'd be a schedule out there with a nice low score with all these rules. There's not. That schedule score is too high. Well, what are we gonna change then? Somewhere where we said we are not willing to play this, now we have to be willing. Or somewhere where we said I'd really like to play this, now we'd have to say I'd still like it, but maybe not as much as I thought. And you tinker with your penalty values and you add some more 999 constraints and you remove some others and you shrink the solution space, but then you expand the solution space and then you run it again. And then you come in in the morning, you throw all those schedules away, tell the computer why you're throwing them away. You know, I saw a question in here about machine learning. This is a great, machine learning problem because you can read the room. You could read the humans. You can understand why we're throwing this schedule away or why we're changing that penalty. And if we could ever get to a point where a tool could understand everything going on in Howard Katz's mind and everything going on in Roger Goodell's brain, you know, that would inform the search and we'd be a lot smarter and presumably we'd get to optimal or at least close to it a lot faster. So early in the process, we get there pretty quick. Later in the process, when we've got our full complement of, you know, 26, 27,000 rules written, it takes a little longer. There's simply fewer needles in the haystack. But if you find a needle, you know it's pretty good. So in that, what you just talked about, which also touches on the, one of the audience questions, <clears throat> the, um, the idea of a constraint and, you know, in optimization, we'll often talk about them either as penalty values or constraints. You know, sometimes people call them hard constraints versus soft constraints. You know, how do you approach that? You know, and you've touched on this a little bit. When do, when do you say like, you know, we're absolutely never going to do that. We will never put a team on four away games in a row, or we're never going to do, you know, we're never going to finish four uh, we're never going to finish the the, uh, the month of December on, on the road or something like that. You know, what, what is the, uh, where do you make that and how do you make those trade-offs on, you know, where the penalties come in and where are the things that are absolutes versus things that if I had to, I'd, I'd, I'd tolerate that in the schedule. I'd tolerate, you know, back-to-back uh, uh, -back uh, cross-country trips or other things like that. Look, early in the process, everything's a hard constraint, you know? I mean, look, you mentioned a few that are evergreen. You know, nobody's going to play a four-game road trip, and, you know, we're never going to finish the season with a three-game road trip. And if you had, you know, the scheduling inequity of a three-game road trip or a road after a road Monday or whatever it is that the coach and general manager really hated, if you had it happen to you last year, it's unlikely it's going to happen to you again this year. You know, everything's a hard constraint early in the process. But like we said, at some point, all those rules going in as hard constraints, all those rules going in as 999 rules – at some point, the computer's going to come back and it's going to tell you there are zero solutions found. And the solution space is infinite, right? There's hundreds and hundreds of trillions of possible schedules. For us to have written enough hard rules, hard constraints that we now can find zero takes a lot less time than you would think. It, it happens, unfortunately, shockingly very quickly. So at that point, you know there's really no such thing as a hard constraint. Now, again, four, four in a row on the road, you know, stadium blocks, if the building is simply not available, that's a hard constraint. But Packers Cowboys should be on Sunday night football. That's not a hard constraint. Or Packers Cowboys should be in December instead of October. 
that's not a hard constraint. That's a gut feel instinct sounds like the right way to deploy that asset you know again using the analytics using some of the tools that we have at our disposal that we didn't used to you could talk about you know the ceiling for how much value you can get out of packers cowboys but you can also talk about the risk mitigation and if we are willing to risk packers cowboys in week 14 on monday night football look at how good the rest of this schedule is and so by using the scoring system that we use and using the optimization tools that we have, you can really begin to get a feel for the opportunity cost of each decision. When the boss says, I want Cowboys Packers in October on Fox as a double header, and the next day your scores go up by 25%, that's a lot of three game road trips and a lot of thin one o'clock windows and a lot of stadium constraints that might not be worth taking on just to put Cowboys Packers on a Fox doubleheader in October. So maybe you drop that penalty a little bit and you run it again. And if the software keeps putting Cowboys Packers on Sunday night football in December, you know, we talk about a stickiness factor. If that game keeps going there over and over and over again, there's a reason, you know, the math is telling you, this is where that game belongs. If you don't want to see it there, you've got to have a really good reason for why not. And you've got to be willing to accept the cost of that. And it might be, like we said, a few more three-game road trips, a few more teams playing games against teams coming off their bye, a couple of quick stadium turnarounds, some other events in the building, whether it's a college football game or something else. You know, perfect world, we don't have any of that. Like we said, no stadium constraints, no travel constraints, no team mad at us, every network happy with us. That would be great. Not sure that schedule exists. So you've really got to try to figure out how to split the baby and make sure that everybody feels like they got something. You know, nobody gets everything, but hopefully everybody gets something. So we've talked about, you, you've alluded to some of the things that make things hard, but I think it would be, uh, and you and I have talked about it in the past, I think it would be really useful uh, to, to understand that for, um, uh, for everybody here. So you mentioned um, um, some of these, you know, the, these specific, like, you know, the priorities on the games, you know, I have talked previously about like the complexity of the Thursday night games uh, are the international games, the ones that get played in Europe or there've been uh, you know, some in, 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 uh, uh, in other, other regions. Um, what are the things that are, that, what are some of the things that just make it particularly hard to generate the, the schedules? Yeah, you, I mean, you mentioned the two of the two of the most challenging constraints that we faced already, uh, the international games and the Thursday night football games, not so much because, you know, those games have to be, uh, you know, within a certain range or within a certain parameter, or I'd love to see it in October instead of November, you know, those all are areas where we have some flexibility and you can let the solver kind of run and guide you to making better decisions for things like international games and Thursday nights there is no guide, you know, those go in as hard constraints. So when the international group and our friends in, you know, London or Mexico decide it's going to be these two teams and they're going to play this week because Wembley's got soccer or rugby or something else going on in, in other weeks, you know, this is when we're going to play this game. Locking in any one of these 256 assets to a specific time, specific slot, specific network, specific week, lops off huge portions of the search space. On the one hand, that's a good thing because we're never getting through the entirety of the search space anyway. So shrinking it helps us with our search and with our solves, but we are likely missing optimal at that point. As soon as you put you know, that London game into week five, and now that brings with it certain considerations about where they can be the week before and whether or not they have to have their bye the week after. And if their bye is in a certain week, then their Thursday game has to be separated from the bye because you don't want your break your bye week and your mini buy after your Thursday to be too close together. You want them spread around, you know, anything that we have to lock in shrinks the space, which is both good and bad. So, you know, the Thursday games, every team can only play one of them. So if we put a Thursday night game on in a certain week, you're not just impacting those two teams, you're impacting the other 30 as well, just in terms of where their Thursday game now can go and who they're eligible to play and is their stadium available and where are they the week before. We don't want you on the road before you play a road Thursday. And again, we want to separate your bye from your Thursday, but your bye may have to track with your London game coming back from overseas. So anything that we have to lock in, um, you know, we know we're suboptimal at that point. The more we have to lock in, probably the more we have to be willing to compromise in other areas. And again, like we say, it's this delicate balancing act between, you know, who's going to pay for it. Is it our television partners? Is it our teams? 
it, it's a little bit of everything. So um, those London games, those Thursday night games, you know, those, I don't want to say they're foisted upon us, but, you know, those are things that we've committed to as a league. They are initiatives and priorities for us. So whatever the cost of it is, it, it's a cost we're willing to pay. Now then, how do we work around those parameters? We know that these two teams are going to be in London in week six. So they can't be on Sunday night football because that'll be three o'clock in the morning over there. And they can't be on Monday night football the week before because we don't want to shorten their preparation to travel. And we know they have to have their bye the week after. And so every one of these decisions has a trickle down effect. And the, the, the exercise is really to minimize that trickle down effect, have the things that we have to do impact us in the least negative way possible. And to your point earlier, you don't really know that in February when you've only got about 50% of the rules written and you're hitting the button and you're solving it and everything's coming back and, you know, everything's rosy and, and all is good. Oh, sure, we can do that for this team. And no, oh, sure, we can give that to that network. At some point, you get to a point where you can't do everything for everybody. And now you have to start making some real tough decisions. And as much as the analytics and the data and the optimization can help us, it's still human, right? It's still Howard Katz and Roger Goodell have to be willing to get on the phone with the owner of the Buffalo Bills and explain to them why they drew the short straw this year. And I don't know that we're ever going to completely replace that element of this process, but if the machine learning and the analytics and the optimization can help us make better decisions, then we can feel better about making that phone call to Buffalo and explaining to them why it happened to them and promise them that it's not going to happen again anytime soon. So that's, that's a really great tie into a, a question that just, just came in the last few moments is how does that uh, buy-in go from the different stakeholders? You know, what does it look like when they, when they look at the, the results of what you do and, uh, and, and they say, you know, great job, Mike, or nobody, eh, nobody, says, that. You do. nobody <laughs> says that. Um, look, the truth of the matter is, you know, as this notion of optimization has become more commonplace, you know, I think people really do understand that you can't be all things to all people. And so the hope, the goal is that the rules that we're breaking are the least impactful ones, whether it's on the television partners in terms of viewership and revenue or on the teams in terms of competitive fairness. You know, nobody's gonna look at their schedule in May and say, great job, we love it. You guys did a wonderful job. But hopefully they look at it and say, all right, if the worst thing about our schedule this year is this one game is in week 11, and maybe that's a little later than I would have wanted to go to, you know, Cleveland or, or Buffalo for the weather, or, you know, ah, I'd much rather would have played those guys, you know, coming off a home game rather than a road game. But if everybody's got one little thing that they're pointed at, I think they understand that, you know, that's their dues. You know, my, my boss, Howard, always says, you know, we, we collect the revenue from the television partners. And if as a team, you want your 132nd of that revenue, you've got to be willing to accept 132nd of the pain. And hopefully, again, everybody evenly sort of takes on some of the pain. And if in any given year, somebody really did get the short straw, you know, last season, we had a stretch of games. It was Tampa Bay, they had a game in London. And so that wasn't really a game in Tampa. It was technically a home game. But you know, it was a game out of their building. I think they had a six or seven week stretch without a game in Tampa. That's something that, you know, wasn't good and something that we weren't proud of and something that I feel pretty confident saying we would never do again. Was it worth it to have Tampa take on, you know, an outsized portion of the team pain last year in exchange for otherwise most of the teams being relatively happy and our television partners being relatively happy? You know, I'm not sure Tampa would say it was worth it, but, you know, those are the kind of questions that, you know, at least having the tools that we have now allows us to make those decisions a little bit more smartly. Was it the right thing to do? Who knows? Was it the best overall schedule for the NFL? You know, last April, it felt like it was. Uh, that being said, I, I think we all learned a valuable lesson, and I, I doubt very much you'll ever see a stretch where a team has six consecutive weeks out of their building, but it was a good lesson for us all where, you know, optimization can either spread the pain evenly and everybody has one thirty second of the pain, or maybe this is the year where Tampa or the Raiders have, you know, six or eight 30 seconds of the pain. And there's a few teams that had no pain. They should expect that they're going to see some of that pain moving forward. And hopefully Tampa and, and the Raiders felt real good about their schedules this year. Um, I'm sure they felt like we owed them one. And I think you had that in your other presentation where you had that, um, that, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, table that showed, you know, which year he, with the, a whole bunch of different paint points and each Indian, you listed every team and you said, you know, how, how recently did they, did they have this sort of unpleasant element or the, it, this, 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 this uh, avoidable or, or, or uh, uh, element to the schedule. We're mostly finished wrapping up, but I'd like to see if we could sort of finish off on, on a question of, you know, future directions of what's new. So you focus so much on the scheduling portion of the NFL, but there's lots of other opportunities for optimization in, in professional sports. I've seen applications of referee scheduling. I've seen some leagues that they do dynamic ticket pricing and revenue management. I've even seen a few teams in professional sports that use optimization for team roster construction, you know, figuring out whom they're going to trade, whom they're going to draft, who they're going to put on the field from, uh, from week to week. And um, so where do you see as some of the, the uh, uh, you, you've, I know you've got plenty of challenges in, in scheduling, you're not ready to, to uh, retire yet, but if you were to try to, to, to look forward to what are the great opportunities for other applications of optimization on the league and on the team by team level in the NFL, where do you see they could be? Yeah, I mean, you hit on a few already. I, I think I said in the last presentation, you know, data is the new oil. That's what makes business go. You know, everybody is trying to interact with their customers, trying to understand better what they want from us, what we can deliver. You know, some of it, if it's easy to do, we should be doing it right now. Others might be a little bit more difficult, or again, it's a zero sum game. That which is good for, you know, the television partners might be bad for competitive fairness. Um, but, but I do think the, the notion of optimization, you put yourself in the best possible position and then you see what happens, right? The chips fall where they may. Um, you know, the ticket pricing is obviously a big one. Uh, I think the biggest opportunity, obviously outside of scheduling for us, whether it's scheduling referees or television production trucks or, or the game travel itself, um, I think the biggest opportunity for us all, and I think where you're going to see the biggest change from the NFL is on player health and safety. Um, you know, it, it's something that we've obviously talked about for a long time and made, you know, dozens of rule changes. And, you know, it's easy to say, of course, we shouldn't be hitting each other in the head with our helmets. That can't be good for us. You know, that, that one was relatively easy. But, you know, what about things like sleep patterns? What about things like nutrition? What about things like practice? You know, we all grew up playing sports and coach always told you, you know, shake it off and, and work harder and, and keep pushing. And, and maybe that's not always the smartest way to attack some of these issues. So maybe as we look forward into some of these optimization opportunities, whether it hits scheduling or not, you know, we know a short week Thursday is a challenge for all of our clubs. So we do try to be sensitive to where are you the week before and where are you the week after and how spaced out is your Thursday game, which gives you a little bit of extra rest time afterwards from your bye week, which gives you a whole week of rest time. I think you're going to start to see a lot of that. You know, you mentioned they've already started doing with some roster construction, you know, how much of our salary cap can we afford to devote to our offensive line? Um, I think you're going to see the same thing in terms of practice and nutrition and travel. You know, when you get on an airplane and you travel three time zones to go play a game against the Steelers in Pittsburgh, you know, if you're the Chargers and you're making that trip, do you go Friday and spend a little extra money on hotels and meals and meeting space to have a whole day Saturday to, you know, get your body acclimated to the Eastern time zone and then wake up Sunday and play? Or do you go Saturday and don't try to change things too much because, you know, you don't want to get out of rhythm because you do still have another game the week after. So I think a lot of the player health and safety stuff is going to start to become a lot more analytical, a lot more data driven. Um, but even then, you know, it, it really comes down to feel, you know, I don't think anybody's going to tell Tom Brady how to get ready to play football. I, I think that guy knows what to do to be ready to go at kickoff on Sunday at one o'clock. So it, it still comes down to, you know, gut feel instinct, but these tools are all going to enable us to make smarter decisions. And whether it's the price of a ticket or which game is on television or what time we kick off or how long the commercial breaks are or what I had for breakfast that morning, you know, all we can ask for is the best information when we need it. And then hopefully we make the right decision. And then when we're there and it's, you know, go or no go, make the decision, make the play, uh, you know, hopefully you're in the best position and uh, we haven't done anything from a scheduling standpoint um, that's going to hurt you and your ability to be your best on that day. Awesome. Hey, thanks so much, Mike. This has been a lot of fun for me. I hope it has been for the audience as well. 
um, I'll turn it back over to Blair for any uh, wrap up. Enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Great. Thank you, Mike and Greg, for that excellent discussion. And thank you, Mike, for joining us today and everyone for dialing in. Again, thanks for joining us for Grobe Days Digital. Take care and we'll see you next time.